Specialist at the Nancy M. Cummings Research Extension and Education Center in near Salmon, Idaho. And he's going to come and share with us a little bit about a comparison of ranch-based and irrigated cow-calf systems. Uh, and that's some of the work that's being done there uh, at the Nancy M. Cummings Center. So, John, if you would like to share your screen and uh, we'll get that presentation started. Okay, Benton, is that showing up? It is, yes. Okay, thank you. It's great to be here this, uh, this morning. Uh, I know I'm between you and lunch and I guess I could go really fast and talk like this and can and get us through, but um, probably trying to kind of keep moving along. As Ben said, this is being recorded. So if you um, need to, uh, to get some clarifications on things, please don't hesitate to either go back to the recording or, or contact me. So a few years back in 2016, we got the opportunity through a lot of different uh, partners uh, with the university, including legislators and conservation groups and the Idaho Cattle Association to access the Rinker Rock Creek Ranch, which the University of Idaho has now acquired. And so this gave us an opportunity where at the Nancy Cummings Center, we're an all irrigated uh, system here at the research center. And so this finally gave us an opportunity to do research that was more industry relevant because it had a range component. And so the start of this particular project was to look at uh, the difference between the range-based systems and the irrigated cow-calf systems. Our objectives for today is really to relate to you the results of the five years of the experiment that's gone on so far, to try and encourage you to think about what might be options for your operation um, in terms of how, how these data might relate to you. And then a big point for us is really to get your input and feedback and maybe not immediate, but if you want to send me an email or put it in the chat, it'd be great. But where we go next with this research, what kinds of things should we be looking at that will be valuable to you in your operations or for your clients that you might help? So the research objectives for this particular research project were really to compare these two systems, an all irrigated system versus the more traditional range-based system in Idaho look for areas of improvement in each system, and then really to look, get down to the science part of it is to look at what are some of the physiological ramifications of these different nutritional uh, management systems or nutritional exposures that the cattle get, uh, get during the two systems. Try and look at some management options within the systems and then to conduct some economic comparisons among the system. So you probably saw on that first slide, there's a huge number of people involved with this uh, research project and they all bring different things back into this project. Briefly to go over the design, the cows at the Nancy Cummings Research Extension Education Center in 2016 were split as equally as we could possibly do it so that the cows were equally representative in terms of genetics and productivity and age and weight to either range or irrigated systems. Uh, this cow herd is a Hereford Angus based cow herd. We, uh, all the cows and replacement heifers are Angus Hereford crosses in some way, shape or fashion. Uh, they, we do breed to uh, some Simmon Angus bulls so that a roughly half to a little more than half of the calves are sired by Sim Angus bulls, but we only retain Hereford or he Angus sired heifers into the system. Once assigned to the system, then that cow stays in that system and her female offspring uh, go back into that system. Uh, heifers are AI'd and cleaned up with the same bulls um, with, and the same cleanup bulls are used. And then cows are AI'd to the same bulls regardless of herd, but then moved out to their locations. And we'll see that in a minute. One of the big things that is uh, important to note in this project is we manage the cows to calve at body condition score five. That's both from a reproductive standpoint and an animal care standpoint. And so we've recorded the feed, extra feed that's needed for those systems. We won't discuss that in detail today, but that's a big part of the data that we need to crunch. And if cattle were used for other experiments, then they were equally distributed across the irrigated and range systems so that there wasn't any bias uh, from that standpoint. This is kind of a flow chart that tells you, shows you what, uh, where those cattle go. So all the cows, uh, regardless of system, uh, calve at the Nancy Cummings Center. They stay there through the first part of spring. They get brand, go through branding and then go through AI. 
immediately after AI, the cows that go to the Rinker Rock Creek Ranch go out to range and the cows on the Nancy Cummings Center go to pasture. So the pasture cattle stay through a managed intensive grazing system on our improved pastures that are irrigated. And then in the fall, they move to either grazing hay, hay crops or crop residues or other kind of standing forage that we have for those cows to try and get them up through December. Our goal is not to feed cows until Christmas if we can, if we can help it. The range cows stay at the Rinker Rock Creek Ranch until mid-October and then they're moved to the sheep station in Du Bois. Uh, and there they are, stay on winter and fall range. And most of the time they receive some sort of protein supplementation. Then both groups uh, receive hay. And uh, in the case of maybe the, the range cows, maybe a little bit of supplement uh, when they return to the Nancy Cummings Center. So that kind of gives you the flow on the cow side. On the calf side, of course, the calves stay with their mothers until weaning. They're weaned, uh, fence line weaned, either on pasture at the Nancy Cummings Center or into wet meadows at the Rinker Rock Creek Ranch. They stay there for about two weeks and then they all come back to the Nancy Cummings Center. The heifers go on pastures or crop residues, that's the pink arrows. And then uh, the steers move immediately into the grow safe unit, which is our, our nutrition unit that we can get feed efficiency and feed intake data. They go through an intake about, about a 60 day intake trial. And then they are moved to the feedlots and agri-beef and agri-beef purchases those calves from us, but gives us the carcass data back. And then the heifers uh, after December, they go into a heifer development project in the grow safe, which involves um, a feed efficiency trial and also then estrus synchronization and, and AI. And we'll talk about some of those details later. Not to go into this in detail, but just to point out, we collect a lot of data uh, across this project and we still have a lot of data that we need to crunch in, in addition to what you'll see today. So let's talk about those results. Let's talk a little bit about what we found. Um, we wish every calf that came off a of range looked like this fella. Uh, certainly a, a nice calf and uh, we'll see some differences here in just a minute. So the first thing we wanted to look at was what happens to the cows on this project? and how, how are their weights changed. So this graph, the black bars show the body weights for the cows on the irrigated system. The gold bars show the body weights for the cows on the range system. And then the, the numbers that you see down here are the body condition scores. And just a reminder, we like cows to be in about a body condition score five, at least by the time they're calving. So what happens is, of course, on this irrigated ground with the good pasture, we see an increase in body weights and body condition scores uh, in, the rain, in the irrigated cows compared to the range cows. By and large, the range cows kind of maintain their weight. They do lose some weight, but they definitely lose body condition score throughout the grazing series and so up until December. And part of that uh, you see is remember that this weight gain that especially occurs from about weaning and through the end of grazing season should also be partially the weight that's associated with the increased uterine size, fetal fluids, and the size of the fetus. So what's happening is these, these cows on range are, are roughly maintaining their weight, but they're losing body condition because they're trying to, gen, to shunt nutrients to those calves, uh, to those fetuses, and keep that fetus growing. On the other hand, these cows on the irrigated system are gaining some body condition that we might be able to utilize later uh, in the winter to reduce feed costs. The other thing that's important is what happens reproductively to these cows. And one of the things we were afraid of when we went out to range was that the dramatic change in nutrition that happens when they step off the truck and get into the range, even though that spring range is pretty good, that early summer range is good, was going to show up in decreased pregnancy rates. And Really, we see no difference in overall pregnancy rates or the percentage of open cows uh, between the two systems, whether it be range or irrigated. About five to six percent of the cows are open every year. Now, if you look up at 2016 and 2018, you see some, some big numbers here in the range. Part of this is probably because, remember, these cows that went out to range in 2016 were basically pasture pets. They had never really been on a range before. They had to do a lot of learning. Um, and so we lost some cows uh, just due to um, not being able to adapt to the range. And again, in 2018, that was probably a similar, it was a dry year. 
And we probably were just getting rid of some of those cows that really weren't very range adapted. Uh, in 2020, this number is nice and low, but that asterisk means of the cows that actually got to us in time to get preg checked. And so reminding you that of course, in a cow-calf operation, that weaning percentage or pregnancy rate is the most important factor affecting profitability in a cow-calf operation. We won't talk about weaning percentage today. That's one of those numbers we really need to crunch. We do lose a few more calves in the range system than we do in the irrigated system. Uh, but we need to go back and, and look at that, especially when we look at some of the economics involved with these systems. So basically, uh, those, those cows have done pretty well in those two systems, seem to uh, have adapted okay. But let's look at calf performance. What happens to those calves when they're out there on those two different systems? And what could that tell us about maybe some opportunities for management changes or things we need to do? Pretty busy table here. Uh, steers are located on the top part of the table. Heifers are located on the bottom part of the table. Uh, I'm not gonna go through each one of these numbers, but you can see that in terms of birth weights and age at birth, uh, those it, calves are pretty similar between the irrigated and the range systems. But when we get out to weaning, over the five years that we have data, you can see that our steer calves coming off a range are 60 pounds lighter than the calves that are on the irrigated system. So we're failing to express some of the genetics that are available for those calves on the range side. Similarly, the heifers are about 45 pounds lighter. And then uh, those calves that from the home, at the Nancy Cummings Center are a little younger at weaning and that's simply a logistics system. We wean first at the Nancy Cummings Center and then a couple of days later we run down to Rock Creek and we wean there. And as you can see, the big part of that decrease in uh, cat, calf weight on the range is that those calves on the range are gaining about four tenths of a pound less per day than the calves that are on, um, on the irrigated system. Similarly, heifers, it's, it's about quarter of a pound less a day. And when we have, won't show you that data today, but when we look at that data, we originally thought that most of that loss, we measure, weigh those calves in July and then come back and weigh them in September at weaning. We thought, well, most of that slowdown is gonna happen in the, in the latter part of the season when that forage actually decreases in quality out on range. And we're gonna see those calves really, really slow down. Um, that hasn't seemed to be the case. We gotta look at that data in a little more detail to, to winnow that out. Uh, but it seems like those calves from the day one when they hit, uh, hit range are just not gaining quite as rapidly. And it may have to do with just the forage availability and the amount of time that they spend following their mom and also uh, a lot of activity involved with being out on range. Uh, if we kind of look at from a year to year vari variation in calf average daily gains from birth to weaning, uh, obviously the, as we just saw the average daily gains for the cal calves on the irrigated system uh, uh, around uh, 2.6 or, or so, 2.8. And then uh, for the calves on the, on the range system about 2.3 or 2.4. And one of the things to point out from this graph is, as you would expect, the year-to-year -year variation is greater in the range than it is on the irrigated systems. And that's simply because forage availability and forage quality is pretty consistent from year to year, as long as those pivots keep turning and we don't get too hot a year. In contrast, in 2018 was a dry year for us down at the Rock Creek Ranch. So was 2020, uh, we see a bigger hit on those calves. And that comes back to maybe some things we might think about in terms of management options for those, those calves. So as we know from the data that I just showed you, we have a big difference in those calves when they're weaned, but what happens to them after weaning? And, and this, uh, this little next couple of slides will show you there might be some advantage to hanging on to those calves after weaning, uh, especially those coming off a of range. So when we look at the steer calf performance, uh, and these are steers for which we already have uh, carcass data. So it's not all the steers that have gone through the system, but this gives you some representation. So about 400 and 
50 steers across the five years. Uh, you can see that that, as we discussed earlier, that weaning weight difference is that 40 to 60 pound difference in those half in those steers. When we start the post weaning phase, so after they've been on grass for a little while, then we move them into the feedlot into the grow safe system. You'll see that uh, we've got about a 45 pound difference between those calves on the irrigated and the range with those irrigated calves being heavier. During the time they're on grass, we don't see a big difference in those steers in terms of average daily gains. But once we put them in the feedlot, we see that those calves that are on um, the that came off of range have some compensatory gain. So they narrow that difference between the calves on irrigated ground and, and the range system by about 15 pounds. And that's because those calves that come off of range due to that compensatory gain are gaining about three tenths of a pound more during that 60 day backgrounding period than the calves uh, from the irrigated ground. Now, admittedly, this the diet that these calves are on and because they're allowed a limited access to this diet because of the intake research that we're doing, uh, those gains are probably a little higher than you would normally see in a normal backgrounding operation, but uh, still holds true. If you give us some extra energy to those calves coming off a of range, they will take that energy and utilize it to their advantage and gain more rapidly. So there may be an opportunity to, to pick up some value by having those calves uh, for another 60 days post weaning. And then if we combine that with what Dennis talked about this morning in the increased value in terms of price per calf of those calves being weaned calves, we can see that we've gained on both on weight and also on price per pound. Well, what really happens during a drought year, and this is really dramatic uh, when we compare these. This year coming off of range, those steers that were on, came off of range were almost 100 pounds lighter than the calves that stayed home on the irrigated ground. And even when they were on pasture after, before they went into the feedlot, those calves coming off of range gained about three tenths of a pound more per day than the calves on, that were uh, on the irrigated ground. Similarly, in the, when we got them on that backgrounding diet, and this year we really pushed them along because our contract with AgriBeef said we were supposed to deliver 750 pound steers on average. And we were really concerned with the calves being so much lighter coming off a of range that we weren't gonna make that, um, that weight. We made that weight by five pounds. We brought, sent them a group of calves that weighed 755 pounds. But those calves off a of range gained four tenths of a pound more per day than the calves uh, that came off of the irrigated ground. So again, just a lot of compensatory gain. And really we picked up 40 pounds on those calves off of range. So it really tells you that, especially on these dry years, there may be some advantage to either keeping those calves and backgrounding them, or perhaps we might talk about a little later, maybe even early weaning those calves and bringing them home and put them on better feed because they'll convert that feed very efficiently for you. So what happens to these calves? Those calves still ended up 30 pounds lighter going into the feedlot than the calves off of range. The range calves were 30 pounds lighter entering the feedlot than the calves that were uh, coming from the Nancy Cummings Center in the irrigated system. So what happens to those calves in the feedlot? Well, the first thing we looked at, again, these same 450 pound calves, 450 calves that we've been talking about. And one of the things that really surprised us in this data set was that by the time they get to uh, being finished calves and they're hung up on the rail, there's only about a five pound difference in hot carcass weight between those range calves and the irrigated calves. And that bodes really well for, um, those calves not, should, shouldn't be discounted going into the feedlot if they're coming off of range, at least in our system. Um, and that might be due to how they're treated during that 60 day backgrounding period. So we might pick up some of that advantage there. Uh, and that's again, a portion of discussion for later on, where might we go with this research? Ribeye areas are the same. Uh, notice these are pretty good sized ribeye areas. And part of that is again, not only this heavy carcass weight, but again, we're using some of those Sim Angus bulls and we're picking up some muscling in those, in those with the Simmental genetics. Yield grade, one of the things that we were concerned about was, well, 
if these calves have been out on range and they're a little stressed, are they going to utilize nutrients differently and lay down less muscle and maybe lay down more fat than the calves that have had a, a good nutritional basis throughout their lives? And this seems not to be the case. So again, some interesting uh, information that tells us that, that these range calves are, are doing well in the feedlot for us, despite the fact that they had a little bit of a tough life as nursing calves and, um, and even were still behind going into the feedlot. And at the agri beef lots, uh, when, when they harvest those calves, they just, they just harvest them basically on one or two days. They don't do a lot of sorting and, and they take that, that pen really out all at one time. What happens on quality? Again, we were a little concerned of maybe some, there's a, during the early life of the calf while he's nursing and immediately after weaning is a critical time period for those adipocytes or those fat cells that produce marbling uh, to be activated and to be stimulated. And are we perhaps setting those range cows up for failure in terms of um, producing a quali high quality carcass? Again, when we look across select, cho low choice, medium choice, high choice, and prime, we don't see a lot of difference between the calves that came off of the irrigated system or the calves that came off the range system. <clears throat> Pretty similar in terms of the upper two thirds of choice and prime, which would then be CAB. And these calves would qualify for CAB because the amount of Angus that's, that's in their, their background. And the nice thing is we're still up around 89 to 90% choice and better quality grade. So pretty much industry standard, maybe a little more select uh, percentage than we're seeing in some of the kill data coming off, uh, coming out lately, but a good set of calves that it looks like they're pre weaning environment and maybe the environment that they were exposed to as fetuses is not changing things now. Dr. Phil Bass and Dr. Michael Cauley are, and their students are looking at, are there differences in tenderness and palatability and other physical attributes of the final product that may not be captured just in quality grade. Um, and so that's gonna be interesting to see that data come forward as part of this project. So we've talked about that the cows generally are in pretty good shape, except they, the range cows come home a little thin and we have to feed them a little more. We've talked about that our, our calves uh, uh, come home considerably lighter or when they come back after weaning are considerably lighter in the range system than they are in the irrigated system, but they make up ground in that backgrounding phase. And then when they get into the feed yard, it seems like they perform just as well as the calves uh, that came out of the irrigated system. But what about replacement heifers? Those, you know, we are, are, are that 1x type of operation, except that we keep almost all of our heifers uh, for research purposes uh, at the re at the, uh, in the research program. But what happens to those heifers? And is there any difference in those heifers, especially reproductively? Are those heifers just as fertile or, or have we compromised them? Because as fetuses, they've been seeing a little, little uh, more nutritional stress or even as nursing calves, uh, because they haven't been as well nourished out on range as their counterparts uh, out in the um, irrigated system. So one of the first things that we look at is we look at growth and performance of those heifers, and we look at feed efficiency as well. And one of the interesting things that's come out of this project is that the, cal the heifer calves coming off of range, more of those calves fall into the inefficient category compared to the cal calves coming off the irrigated ground, which have a higher percentage of calves in the, in the efficient category in terms of feed efficiency and productivity. We're not sure why this is at this point, and we need to do a little more investigation. One theory could be that because these heifers are exposed to uh, forage that may not be as high in quality, that they're uh, GI tract is larger and uh, they have more capacity. And so when they get into the, the feed efficiency testing system and they have all they can eat of a fairly high quality diet, they've just got a greater capacity to take in feed uh, and, and maybe are not converting that quite as efficiently as 
the heifers from the irrigated ground. We need to look at that information more in detail to try and winnow out where that difference is coming. But right now, it appears that maybe those heifers coming off of range are a little less efficient in terms of being uh, measured at feed efficiency in the feedlot during a growing phase, but that might be to their advantage later in life when they're out on range. <clears throat> With uh, the four years of data that we have across uh, heifers from the two different systems, uh, no difference as we saw earlier in birth, about a 45 pound difference at weaning. And they maintain that difference really across uh, both yearling and breeding. Uh, the difference becomes less. Again, they may have some compensatory gain on the heifers as well. Um, and, but as still about a 25 uh, or 35 pound difference in between, about a 25 pound difference between the, the heifers on range being lighter than the heifers uh, that came off of the irrigated system. These heifer weights are pretty high. And again, that goes back to the fact that these heifers are in, in a feed efficiency trial where they're given uh, all, their, all they are able to hold and uh, not the ideal maybe system for rearing heifers. And again, that's something we might wanna talk about is where we'd go in the future with, uh, with this program. Then what we're really interested in is not only the growth and efficiency of these heifers, but what does that translate to in terms of reproduction? One of the things that we do to when we first measure reproduction is we actually look at the reproductive tract of those heifers through either ultrasound or palpation. And we look at the follicles on the ovaries. We look at the size of the uterus. We look at basically the maturity of that uh, animal in terms of reproductive maturity. We give that animal a score of one to five with five being a, a cycling heifer that's ready to breed and a one is being a heifer that's extremely infantile. So we give these, uh, get, take these measurements when the heifers are about 13 to 14 months of age. And so seeing an average of about 3.6 or 3.5, we like to see those heifers around that four on average. And so these heifers are pretty good in terms of being fairly reproductively mature and really no difference between cat heifers coming off of the range or irrigated system. More recently, in the last few years, we've started looking at what we call antral follicle counts, where we actually use the ultrasound machine to look at the small follicles that are on the ovary and research by others uh, across the United States has indicated that perhaps heifers that have higher antral follicle counts prior to breeding may be more fertile and also may have a longer longevity or a greater longevity in the herd. We don't see an extreme uh, difference between the heifers on ear that were developed on the irrigated system or the range system. And so again, uh, this is a limited amount of data and we'll get more data uh, in the next few years as we go along. And then how do those heifers breed up? When we put those heifers through estrus synchronization programs, and there's been a variety of estrus synchronization programs that we've used for research purposes. And as I just told you before, we stratify those heifers from the two systems across different systems if we're comparing systems within a year, so there's no bias. But we, we look at those animals and see, have those animals been in heat prior to a fixed time to AI? And we see about 73 to 74% of the heifers, regardless of systems, showing estrus. Uh, we use sex semen in a lot of these systems. And so our AI pregnancy rates are not quite as high as we'd like to see overall, but that's a function of sex semen plus the other research that we're doing with these heifers. But really no difference in the percentage of heifers that breed AI about a 2% uh, advantage to the heifers on the irrigated system versus the range. But statistically, that's not a, a big enough difference to really, really say there's anything there. And then we end up with about 89% of the heifers being pregnant uh, at the end of the breeding season. And that's not unusual for heifers uh, because these are untested females. And normally it's, uh, it's pretty normal in most operations to expect about a 10% uh, open heifer rate uh, in, these, in these females when we're looking at breeding heifers. So people always ask, well, which system's best when, you, when you've been done this research for over five years? And 
there's good news and, and there's uh, opportunities uh, that are available as well. The good news is that we haven't seen any difference in, uh, in these cows that are managed out on sagebrush step versus these irrigated cows in terms of cow reproduction, carcass quality of the calves or heifer reproduction. So um, a, good, a good, uh, good place for us to start. Uh, so shows us that we maybe don't have a, a lot of things to worry about in terms of, of the system our traditional system that we use. And that's probably no surprise for those of you that have been doing this for the last uh, 80 to 100 years, but um, it is something we, it was interesting to, to learn, especially as we get pressure uh, to maybe um, decrease the amount of, of range utilization we have, we can see that we're not really gonna gain a lot of efficiencies by changing to a different system. Uh, the other thing that's an advantage is those calves exhibit compensatory gain. And so that might be some opportunity for us to capture that and create uh, some economic advantage for us uh, by uh, keeping those calves after weaning. But what's out some challenges and opportunities? Well, on the range system, we see that calves are lighter at weaning. So again, we have to figure out some way to offset uh, either through, as, as Ben would say, uh, decreasing cow costs because the calf's gonna be less valuable at weaning or we increase uh, the, the value of that calf by maybe hanging on to that calf, going through a, a backgrounding process and selling a weaned calf that's 60 days weaned, plus has captured some of that compensatory gain. Cows lost body condition. Uh, and that resulted us to require cows to have extra feed in order to get them back to body condition score five at calving. And there's a lot of research across the years that certainly says, if we can get a cow to calve and body condition score five, then we normally don't see any reproductive problems with that cow rebreeding. And certainly the data that we showed you today would, uh, would support that. The problem is that this has been pretty costly. I mean, we have, we know how many pounds of hay, what kind of hay we fed to each one of these groups. The diets that we're feeding these cows are during the, when they come back from range, the range cows are being fed much high quality diet, a more expensive diet than the cows that have been here at the Nancy Cummings Center where we actually can incorporate some straw into the diet for those cows in the last trimester on the Nancy Cummings cows. And then of course, we talked about those impacts on efficiency um, in the heifer side of things. Does that translate into lifelong uh, changes in efficiency or is that change that we see in efficiency actually an adaptation to being out on range. For the irrigated cows, our cows on these irrigated systems continue to be too large. Heifers tend to be pretty fleshy. Are the cows carrying too much condition? And so that uh, asks the question, do we need to change our grazing management? Instead of putting all that grass through the cows, uh, even though those calves can use that really high quality cow, could do we maybe creep graze those calves and let those cows clean up? Or do we run some yearlings in front of our front of our cow calf operation? Um, there's a lot of options that we could maybe think about to do a better job of capturing the value of that high quality forage and instead of just letting it be fat on the back of the cow. So this is kind of one of those poor parts uh, where I'd like to open it up and again put something in the chat or. Uh, where do we go? Where should this research go next? I think we've we've done a pretty good job of establishing the differences in calf performance um, in these in these different systems. We've uh, looked at maybe some backgrounding operations. Maybe there's some opportunity to look at early weaning. I don't know. Is that something you'd be interested in, or is that just such a logistical nightmare for you that yeah, we could look at that, but it wouldn't be of any value to you. Um, there could be some opportunities to increase cow condition through early weaning and decrease those feed needs later on in those range cows. I don't know, that's something, um, certainly the economics side of the equation we need to look at more, more heavily. Um, <clears throat> we certainly haven't put a lot of stress on these cows to be the ideal range adapted cow. Um, so maybe that's where we need to go. Do we need to not baby these cows when they come back and, and let whoever makes it make it and keep those genetics and get rid of those? Uh, Dr. Brenda Murdoch is uh, our genomist that's involved with this project and she and others are trying to look at 
genetic markers for heifer adaptability and cow adaptability to range and also fertility. So um, these are all some, some, some things that if you think they're of interest to you, we'd like to certainly know before we head off on, on the next phase of this project. Um, so please uh, let us know and give us some ideas. Kind of to wrap things up, really would like to thank a lot of people. Uh, even though you see some support from the USDA, that's our, what we call our hatch projects and that's what helps support the uh, Idaho experiment stations, but that's not a big grant. And these applied type research projects generally are hard to fund through the USDA research. So we rely a lot on our industry partners to provide either uh, in-kind or financial support. And most of this has been in-kind. Agri-Beef gives us the carcass data back on these calves and has been very uh, helpful in purchasing the calves from us to help our cash flow here at the research station. Select Sires has, has supported us through semen as well as help, uh, help with uh, technicians. American Simmental Association has supplied semen and also some dollars back to us for providing carcass information. KIAG has provided product support as well as financial support. Zoetis has provided ester synchronization drugs. ST Genetics has provided some semen. Estrotech has supplied the uh, markers that we use uh, to uh, know whether cattle have been mounted or been in heat or not. And certainly not to, to fail to recognize the hours and hours that staff and graduate students of the Nancy M. Cummings Center and the Rinker Rock Creek Ranch have, have put into these projects. And again, we've also partnered in a lot of these projects with the University of Missouri, Texas A&M and Colorado State. So the work that we're doing here at Idaho is also helping our partners across the, the region as well. Uh, with that, I'll be glad to entertain any questions. I've gone through these data fairly rapidly, but hopefully it's been understandable for you. And uh, Scott, uh, if anybody needs to contact me, there's my email address and I'll be glad to take some questions and then let people get to, uh, get to lunch or dinner, depending on who you are and what you call it. Benton, you're not muted. Yeah. Hey, thanks, John, for that presentation. We appreciate you doing that and sharing some information about what's going on there at the center and uh, uh, very good information. So thank you. There were a couple of questions that came up in the uh, question and answer section. One was, uh, what was the TDN increase to for 2020 in the growth safe system? I think you mentioned that there was a little bit of change there. Do you remember yes. what the yeah, I would say we'd have to probably I'd have to go back and look at those diets to give you a precise answer, but there's probably an additional three to five percent TDN in that diet compared to a uh, normal diet. So just kind of give you a physical breakdown of the of the diet. Um, we we normally run about a thirty percent concentrate, seventy percent um, roughage diet. In, in when those steers are in the grow safe system. And that's uh, usually wheat mids, uh, crack corn, and uh, the liquid from the Performix, uh, Performix liquid. And this year we were at a 65%, 35% forage to concentrate ratio. So, okay. and, uh, and added a little, that increase in concentrate was more on the corn side than it was the wheat mid side. Appreciate Great that. question. Yep. So then another question, what are the increased feed cost on those range cows? And, and so that's an excellent question. And that's one of the things that we haven't crunched all those numbers. We have feed sheets from every day for the last five years, and we need to go back and, and look at that. And that's a big, a big thing that we're going to look at. So for example, the diet for the, uh, the Nancy Cummings cows is about a third straw, uh, a, a third alfalfa hay, and then a third grass hay or, or small grain hay. And the diet for, especially this year, the diet for the, uh, the range cows is predominantly alfalfa hay and maybe some small grain hay. And then we're adding in about three to four pounds a day. Uh, and this year up to six pounds a day of corn gluten feed pellets. Okay. So that corn gluten feeds a pretty expensive ingredient, but 
It's what we've had to do to make up ground on these cows. And again, that goes back to, should we be feeding those cows or should we be putting pressure on those cows to perform under normal cow conditions yeah. and, and not babying them so much? Uh, and that's kind of a, maybe a question for the future. And then I got one more question that came in the chat and we'll probably end with that one, but uh, are, there, are the cows on range in seedings or native conditions and would it make a significant difference? When the cows are out on range, they're on native conditions. They're all on the uplands. They're on sagebrush steppe uplands. Uh, that we don't utilize the wet meadows at all uh, for those particular cows. At the Rinker Rock Ridge Ranch, the wet meadows get, get used uh, primarily by yearling cattle. They're on different experiments. Occasionally, there might be some outside cows that, that use the wet meadows. And then, of course, we use those wet meadows on um, um, for after weaning for the calves that are weaned. And uh, there may be certainly, I mean, if we were utilizing wet meadows a little more for those cows, so for example, after weaning, if we put those cows at the Rock Creek Ranch on those wet meadows, we could, probably could pick up a lot of body condition score, a lot of body condition on those cows uh, if we did that. But we strictly wanted to keep those cows up on a range type. Uh, so in fall, it's a fairly low protein diet. and. Of course, they enjoy being in the balmy conditions of Dubois from uh, October to uh, December. And yeah. sometimes that, that environment gets a little tough towards the latter part of that, that time. So I think you kind of got at this a little bit that there's probably still numbers to be crunched, but uh, one last question. What's the difference in cost to summer the two groups of cows? And again, that's one of those things that we, we really have to look at. Um, and, and of course, it's one of those that we really need to work with Ben and, and Catherine Lee is on this project to kind of use a budgeting situation because certainly with the research station and even at the Rock Creek Ranch, the way we operate is, is not normal in terms of because we get cows in so often to weigh cows and weigh heifers. Um, the range cows down at Rock Creek Ranch come in a couple of times during the summer, which normally wouldn't happen in, in, in a normal range operation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but those are all excellent questions and very, very important questions to this, this system. And now that we have five years in, I think we can start answering those questions. All we need is more time and more computer power to crunch those numbers. So that's right. So again, John, we thank you for your presentation and, uh, the time you've taken with us here today. If anybody has questions for John or any of the other speakers here this morning, you can continue to type them into the chat and uh, we'll get those questions to those individuals or uh, there's been contact information been given that if you'd like to contact them directly, I'm sure they'd answer your questions that way as well. So we're up to lunchtime or dinner time, as John mentioned. And uh, we have a couple other videos that we're gonna show during lunchtime. Uh, Scott's going to start those up. So we're going to start back uh, as soon as the two videos conclude. That should be about 12, we'll say 1240. And so please be ready to start back about 1240, grab something to eat, something to drink, take a little break, and we'll get started back at 1240. And uh, take time to watch these videos as they play and, and learn a little bit about uh, some things from those Life on the Range videos. So with that, we're going to break for lunch and